everyone, I'm Roland Meadows with Robin's Amazing Photography and I'm a professional photographer. If I had to pick a niche of photography to put myself in, it would be outdoor photography. Now granted, I know that's a pretty general area to put myself in, but I do a little bit of everything. A huge part of what I do, however, is bird and wildlife photography. That's why today I want to teach you, yes you watching this video, how to properly photograph birds and wildlife. I'm talking about gear camera settings, tips and tricks, editing tips, and I'm even taking you all out in the field with me to see how I work. By the time you're done watching this video, you're going to be like all of the professional wildlife photographers you see online. I want to talk a little bit about some equipment that's really important for wildlife photographers to have in order to be successful in the field. It is so important to remember that although camera gear is important, it is not the only factor that's going to help you get a good photo of a wild animal. I'm going to talk about camera equipment in this segment, but before I get into camera equipment, I'm going to talk about some other pieces of equipment that photographers, um, bird and wildlife photographers should have as well besides camera equipment because um, camera equipment alone is not going to get you anywhere. The first thing I want to talk about is camouflage. Yes. Now there's multiple different ways of using camo to blend in with the environment. You can go the extra mile like I have and invest in a ghillie suit or you can simply wear a camouflage shirt when you're going out in the field. There are also things like camo blankets, camo hats, camo netting, and other things that can be used out in the field to help you. Camo netting is something that I like to use a whole lot. You can, buy these, you can buy camo netting in rows on Amazon and it's really handy to kind of just put over the top of your camera when it's sitting on a tripod to help it blend in. You can even cover yourself with it if you find it necessary and you don't have anything like a ghillie suit. I cannot stress to you enough how important it is to blend in with your surroundings. The next piece of equipment that wildlife photographers should own is waterproof boots. Now, waterproof boots is something that's really important because you don't want to get your feet wet. Um, if I'm being honest, animals are around water, so if, you, if you're thinking that I'm crazy for saying waterproof boots, you're thinking, Rylan, I don't live around water, I'm not going to be getting in the water. Well, if you want to find wildlife, you're probably going to find yourself at some point or another around water. And when you're around water, trust me when I say you do not want to be out there getting your feet wet, especially if it's cold outside or just, I mean, who wants to get their feet wet anyways? Like even if it's not cold outside. If you're walking around in your tennis shoes, you're not going to want to have to just get in the water to get a good photo and get your feet wet because that just sucks if I'm being honest. Another piece of equipment that is kind of but not even really equipment that you really need. Um, I cannot stress enough how much you need this more than almost anything else as there's a bunch flying around my face because I didn't put it on before I came out here to film this video, is bug spray. Bug spray is so important because when you're out in the field, you're not going to want little flies and gnats and mosquitoes and all sorts of different stuff flying around you in your face, buzzing in your ear because there's nothing more annoying than that. And um, when you get home from doing photo from taking photos of animals and birds, um, you're not gonna wanna have to deal with pulling ticks off of yourself, cause that's just, for one, gross, two, it can be difficult to deal with, and three, you don't wanna end up with Lyme's disease, and um, you don't wanna be scratching up mosquito bites when you get home either, so it's really important to put on bug spray before you go out in the field to shoot. Unfortunately, I do not have enough time in this video alone to talk about every single piece of equipment that you may need out in the field. So I want to give you all a quick list and a quick rundown of some other things that I have found myself wanting or things that I always have out in the field that are non-camera gear related. These items are as follows. A pocket knife or multi-tool, bear spray, a first aid kit, a lighter or matches, hiking boots, hiking sticks, gloves, binoculars, rain covers for yourself and for your camera gear, flashlights, headlamps, bait, trail cameras, a laptop, a tent, and extra clothes. All of these pieces of gear are super important to, to keep with you because you're probably going to need them at some point in your photography career and when you're out in the field you don't want to be wishing you had something and not have it. So now it's time to get into the segment that I know all of the gearheads watching this video are excited to hear about and that is camera gear. The first piece of equipment that is the most important in terms of camera gear that I want to talk about is your lens selection. In my opinion to start off shooting wildlife you're going to want a lens that is at least 200 millimeters. 
Um, I want to stress the fact that the more experienced that you become, you do not necessarily have to have a long telephoto lens to get good photos of animals, and there's some unique shots that can be captured with a wide angled lens. However, to start off, I really do recommend that you have a telephoto or super telephoto lens. Um, if I had to guess, I would say a pretty good number of people that are watching this video have um, a kit lens that's probably a 70 to 300 or something that's close um, to that focal length. So although that isn't ideal to be using, it is doable to use a lens like that. And I say that because that was me. That was me. I started with a 70 to 300 millimeter f4.5 to 6.3 lens to shoot wildlife with. And still to this day, some of my favorite images that I have ever been able to capture were taken with that lens. Now what I am about to say not only depends on your budget, but it also depends on how you think you're going to stick with wildlife and bird photography, especially if you are a beginner. If you're a beginner and you're sitting there thinking, oh, I'm probably not gonna stick with this. This is just something to kind of pass time. I might do it as a hobby, never gonna be professional. Or I'm just, or I'm interested right now in going professional, but I don't know if that's possible. I don't know if that's feasible. I'm not sure I'm ever going to do that. I'm going to recommend you stick with that kit lens that you might have. If you don't have that kit lens, I'm going to recommend you go and buy a kit lens for $200, $300 that's going to do the job. And for a kit lens, I would say a 70 to 300 is probably the best lens that you'll find. That's for um, Canon and Nikon. I'm really not sure what size in terms of telephoto kit lenses that Sony has, but I would guess that they're a lot like Canon and Nikon and probably have a 70 to 300 that would go with their cameras as well. Now what I am about to say is a big if and I mean a huge if and I mean if you are going to stick with this wildlife and bird photography thing 100% you are going to absolutely want to have a better lens than a 70 to 300 kit lens. So you're not just going to want to go telephoto you're going to want to go with a super telephoto lens which is like the lens that I have. So I'm going to recommend three super telephoto lenses for three different camera um, manufacturers that are the most three common camera manufacturers and which telephoto lenses I think are going to be the best for you to purchase. So if you're shooting Nikon, I'm going to recommend the Nikkor 200 to 500 millimeter. If you are shooting Canon DSLR, keep in mind Canon DSLR, just DSLR, not Canon mirrorless, I'm going to recommend a um, Tamron 150 to 600 millimeter lens, it's going to be great for what you're looking for. If you're shooting Canon mirrorless, which is the R series of Canon, I'm going to recommend you getting the brand new R mount lens, the 600 millimeter F11. It's going to be great for what, you, for what you're looking for doing wildlife photography using mirrorless. Um, if you do know anything about photography, you're probably thinking that an F11 isn't great, but there's been, I, I've heard nothing but good from the 600 F11, so I'm going to recommend it to you. And lastly, if you're going to be shooting Sony, I'm going to recommend to you the 200 to 600 millimeter Sony lens. Um, this is going to be a cheaper grade Sony lens, and it's going to be great for getting started with bird and wildlife photography, and it can last um, even professionals throughout their whole career. Now, before purchasing any lens, based off what I just said, I want you to know that it's not necessary and not required to go and purchase a huge, big, expensive lens to do bird and wildlife photography. Um, I cannot stress that enough. And if you do decide that you're going to um, purchase one of the lenses I just said, I highly recommend you do your own research to make sure that it is going to suit the purpose that you want to use it for. You don't need to go and buy that lens if you think that it's not going to suit the purpose. You want to do research, you want to make sure that it's right for you because there are other super telephoto lenses that I did not recommend that might work for you better than what I just named. I shoot Nikon and I personally shoot with the Nikkor 200 to 500 millimeter f5.6 lens and it absolutely works amazing for me for wildlife and bird photography. The next piece of camera equipment that I want to talk about is a tripod. I use the Zami M6 tripod. It was sent to me by a sponsor and I've loved it ever since. I truly fell in love with that tripod. Along with that tripod for wildlife and bird photography, I use the Neewer wildlife gimbal. I, I think they're an amazing combination to shoot together with. Um, they're both really durable, the tripod and the gimbal head. And to shoot wildlife photography, you're going to want to look for a tripod that is um, not necessarily expensive, but a tripod that's durable, that's going to be able to hold your heavy camera, it's going to be able to be portable, you're going to want to be able to do a lot of different things with it. And you're not going to want to find some trashy Amazon tripod that's $10 like. One second.
One second, one second. One second. You're not gonna wanna use this. You don't want it. $10 on Amazon, worst thing I've ever bought. Why did I buy it? Because I didn't know what I was doing. I want you all to know what you're doing. Don't do that. Don't do that. Not $10 on Amazon. The last piece of camera gear that I want to fully touch base with you all is the camera body itself. And I wanna say that the camera body is not nearly as important as what you think it might be. In fact, it's one of the least important things um, as far as the quality of your final image goes. You could have a $4,000 camera paired with a $200 lens and your images are still not going to be great. Whereas on the contrary, you could have a $2,000 or $4,000 lens and a, I don't know, a $600 camera and your photos are still gonna look really good. They're gonna look nice. The lens is far more important than the camera body so don't think that you have to go out and buy a Canon R5 for $4,000 because that, that is definitely not necessary. A beginner DSLR can go a long way for photography and in fact, that's what I'm going to recommend that you start with if you're a beginner into bird and wildlife photography. I'm not confident in recommending a mirrorless camera to you all for bird and wildlife photography because I just don't think there's one at a beginner level that you're going to want to invest in that's going to get the job done right. Granted, if you go and buy a Canon R5 or a Sony A9, um, it's probably going to work good. You're gonna, you're gonna get good photos because they're good cameras, but they're not entry level photography cameras that are gonna work good for bird and wildlife photography. I can't, I can't sit here in good conscience and recommend to you the EOS R for bird photography or the Nikon Z6 even. I can't recommend either one of those cameras to you for bird and wildlife photography because their animal IEF and stuff is just not going to be up to par, which is really the main reason that you would want a mirrorless camera for bird and wildlife photography. If you haven't yet purchased a camera, it's important to try to find one with a high frame rate. And that is because when there's a bird flying overhead, you're gonna to wanna to be able to do this. You're gonna to wanna to do this right here. You're gonna to wanna to be able to do that. You don't wanna, you don't wanna be click, 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 cause that's just not fast enough. You're gonna miss a moment and it's gonna suck. It's gonna be the worst feeling ever. And I don't want any of you all to have to deal with that because I've been there, I've done that. My first um, DSLR was a four, shot four frames per second, which is not great. It was doable, I did it. I got some really great photos with it. So I mean, you don't, like I said, you don't have to go and spend a bunch of money on a camera for a high frame rate, but the higher that you can find frame rate, the better it's going to be for bird and wildlife photography. Other pieces of camera gear that are probably going to be important that you have that I don't have time to fully go into detail on due to time's sake are as follows. Memory cards, extra batteries, teleconverters, external hard drives, laptops, lens caps, and a camera bag to store all of those things in. Now I wanna take you all out in the field with me to talk about some other things such as composition, camera settings, positioning yourself for a photo along with some other cool things that you need to know to get a really great photo of an animal. So without further ado, um, I'll see you all out in the field. Hey everyone, I'm out here in the field now and this rabbit is absolutely beautiful. There's a few things that I want to talk about in this segment. The first of which is why am I on the ground? Well, anyone can see wildlife from standing up above and looking down at them. As a photographer, your objective and goal should be to get a unique angle and get a nice photo of them um, from a perspective that other people aren't able to see. When you're at, when you're um, down shooting below the animal, looking up at them, or at least down at the animal's eye level, you're gonna get a lot better photo than you would um, looking down on the animal from what is a typical human's perspective looking down. That's not gonna look as good as being eye level. Honestly, the main point of getting down on the ground like this is just to make your photo of that beautiful rabbit look better. Now I want to talk a little bit about camera settings and how they're going to affect the way that your final image looks. I personally shoot with my camera in full menu mode which is the M on your camera's mode dial. However, for this is going to be a lot for beginners to take in. So for a beginner who doesn't fully grasp the concept of the exposure triangle, I would recommend moving your camera's mode dial to the S, which stands for shutter priority mode. You're probably sitting there thinking, what is the exposure triangle? So allow me to briefly explain that 
for you. The exposure triangle is all aspects of photography coming together to make sure that your image is going to be properly exposed and not too dark and not too bright. The exposure triangle consists of three aspects, which are shutter speed, aperture, and ISO. All of these aspects are coming together to perfectly expose an image. As a wildlife shooter that might not yet understand camera settings, as I said, I recommend shooting in shutter priority mode. Therefore, in this video, I'm just going to talk about shutter speed and the effect that it has on your images because the camera is going to be controlling your ISO and aperture for you. Shutter speed does two things. The first thing that it does is brighten or darken your image. A high shutter speed like 1 4,000th of a second is going to make sure your image is darker and not as bright. When a low shutter speed like 1 100th of a second will make your image brighter. If you're shooting in shutter priority mode, you don't really have to worry about the effect shutter speed is going to have on the exposure of your image because the camera is going to automatically be adjusting your ISO and aperture to make sure that the image is still properly exposed even if you do mess up your shutter speed. With that being said, the second thing that shutter speed does is what you need to worry about. Shutter speed controls the motion and movement in your image. Earlier in the video, I mentioned two different shutter speeds, which were 1 4,000th and 1 100th. Notice that I am saying them in fraction form, and that is because each of those numbers I am saying is a fraction of a second. So a shutter speed of 1 4,000th is actually 1 4,000th of a second in time. Now to put things a little bit into perspective, imagine that there is an osprey flying overhead in the air. It is super fast and you want to make sure that your photo is sharp and perfectly in focus, so what sort of shutter speed are you going to want? If you thought that you want a high number, you are absolutely correct. A good shutter speed to have for a fast moving bird would be anywhere between 1 4,000th of a second and 1 1,000th of a second. Granted, this depends on the bird and how fast it is flying, but the higher is typically the better. Now it is important to mess around with your shutter speed and not just leave it on a high fraction of a second because although your camera will control the other factors of the exposure triangle, it can still introduce a great deal of noise and grain into your image. If you're photographing a perched bird or a still animal or a slow moving animal, a good shutter speed to be at would be 1 800th of a second or 1 640th of a second. Take a minute to think in your head about time in general. 1 4,000th of a second is obviously a lot faster in time when freezing a moment than 1 100th of a second would be. Now, if you have a subject that's moving, 1 100th is going to start to introduce some motion blur and you definitely don't want that. A general rule that I like to tell beginners is, to, is that your shutter speed should be double the focal length of your lens. For example, if you're shooting at 200 millimeters, your shutter speed should be no less than 1 400th of a second. If you're shooting at 500 millimeters, your shutter speed should be no less than 1 1,000th of a second. Granted, rarely do I follow that rule and there are definitely exceptions where this rule doesn't apply, but if you're a beginner, I absolutely recommend that you start using this rule and with more experience, you can start to break out of it. Now that was a lot to take in, so feel free to rewind the video and watch that back a few more times to make sure that you properly understand how, what shutter speed is and how it affects your photos. If you're interested in learning how to control every aspect of your exposure and truly learn what the exposure triangle is so you can shoot in full manual mode like I do, once this video is over, I recommend you click this video in the top right corner of your screen where Chelsea and Tony Northrup fully explain what each camera setting does and how they all work together to impact the, photo, the final photo that you're taking. If you aren't a beginner in photography, I recommend you already shoot in full manual mode because you should already have an understanding of the exposure triangle. Um, and that way you're going to have full control of your shutter speed, aperture, and ISO. Now let's get back to me photographing that beautiful rabbit where I'm going to give you some compositional tips and techniques on where to place an animal in the photo. When photographing an animal, there are two compositional techniques that I like to keep in mind. That's the rule of thirds and the rule of space. When um, participating in using either one of these techniques, you're going to have to move your camera to change the position of where an animal is in the photo. When moving your camera, you're also going to have to move your focus point to still be on the subject. In order to move your focus point, you can use either the arrow keys on your camera or the joystick on your camera. So let's talk about these compositional techniques. First off, the rule of thirds. 
The roll of thirds is where you imagine there are two lines going through your image horizontally and two more lines going through it vertically to create nine even rectangles. The rule of thirds advises that to make an image more interesting, rather than placing the subject smack dab in the middle of the image, it should be placed in a way that's off-centered going through the imaginary lines of the image. Look at these two photos of the rabbit. As you can see, the one on the left is perfectly centered and it looks kind of bland and boring. The one on the right, however, is off-centered and that seems to add some sense of interest into the photo rather than it just being a boring photo of a centered animal. The rule of space is a lot like the rule of thirds. Basically, the rule of space is the idea that you should leave more space in front of the animal rather than behind it. If there's more space in front of the animal, it allows the image to flow more accurately to real life. The viewer can look at the image and imagine the animal running off into that open space, whereas if you don't abide by this rule, the viewer can't really imagine the animal going anywhere. These photos on the screen of the rabbit perfectly represent my point. The photo on the left leaves hardly no room in front of the rabbit, making it not as interesting, while the photo on the right does leave room in front of the animal, making it more pleasing to the eye to look at. And it just makes more sense, honestly. Now I want to take you all out with me into the field again. This time I'm going to be walking around in search of some birds to photograph and talk about some general bird and wildlife photography tips that I wish I knew sooner. So I'm out here in the field looking for some birds and since you all are with me I want to take this time not only to search for wildlife but to give you some general tips about photographing wildlife. I want to talk some, I want to talk some about camera techniques as well as working with animals out in the wild. There's a bird in that tree. So something that is super important in terms of the photography technique is the focus mode and focus point that your camera is in. For wildlife photography, regardless of the camera, you want to be in autofocus continuous for your focus mode, which is AF-C. Now if you have a great mirrorless camera that is top of the line, for your focus point, I would recommend using Animal Eye AF when the subject is stationary, and I would use subject tracking or another focus mode that works great for animals when they are actively moving. For all of the DSLR shooters and for all of the people whose mirrorless cameras aren't necessarily top of the line, I recommend single, fo I recommend single point focus, typically. There are some occasions where different focus points work better, however. For example, if a large bird or a group of large birds are flying at me, I would change my focus point to be group focus. If I'm trying to photograph a small fast bird in flight, I would switch my focus point to auto, which is where the camera decides on its own where the focus point is going to be in the photo. I only recommend you allow the camera to choose the focus point if you have a small fast flying bird with a plain background, like the sky behind the bird. I don't have a good visual on it whatsoever, but right up here in this tree line, there is a cardinal um, peeping through some branches. Um, he keeps moving a lot. He keeps going through different trees. Um, he's, okay. He, he looked at me for just a split second there. Uh, uh, and now, now he's just like kind of jumped down below the tree. Um, he picked through it and I got some shots. I don't even know if any of them were in, sharp and in focus. It's very possible that they weren't because that happened so fast. Um, but he just, he just keeps kind of easing his way in the opposite direction of me. Um, I don't really want to chase him, so I'm just going to kind of leave it be. Um, hopefully some of the shots that I was managed, that I, <laughs> that I was able to capture are in focus. Um, if not, it's not the end of the world. I might be able to sharpen them a little bit in Photoshop, but um, you know, that's just something that happens when you're doing bird and wildlife photography. You're never guaranteed an image, and I can't stress that to you all enough. Also, real quickly, while this cardinal is gone, I'm not sure if you all have noticed, but it is thundering very loudly. So um, I'm gonna try not to die out here as well. So that's always fun. Lighting conditions can be complicated, but they are super important when it comes to photographing wildlife. Golden hour is obviously the best time of day to do any kind of photography. 
If you're wondering what golden hour is, it's one hour after the sun rises and one hour before the sun sets. During this time, you're gonna get some of the best light that you're ever going to see and you can get photos like this. You cannot always shoot during golden hour, however, so it is important to know what sort of lighting environment does what. It is not a great time to shoot when the sun is directly overhead, even though that may be what you think is a nice time of day to be out. However, there are some exceptions to being able to shoot when the sun is directly overhead. Anytime there are clouds over the sun, even when it is directly overhead, that's a good time to photograph because the clouds are acting as a natural diffuser to make the light not as harsh. This makes a nice soft light on your subject and can make the image seem rather peaceful. If you're shooting when the sun is shining, it is best to have the sun behind you. The best way to know where the sun is at is to look down at your shadow. If your shadow is stretched out in front of the direction you are standing, you're facing the right way and will get some pretty great photos of whatever animal may appear in front of you. Of course, you don't always have to shoot with the sun behind you because you can still get some pretty great photos with side lighting and back lighting. But generally, to get the best photo of an animal um, with good lighting guaranteed, you want the sun behind you. I'll put some example photos up on your screen in just a second of a front lit subject, a side lit subject, and a back lit subject so you can get a full understanding of what lighting conditions do what. As I mentioned earlier in the gear segment of this video, Camouflaging yourself and blending into the environment around you is something that is really important to be able to get close to animals and make them comfortable. A great way to do this is to photograph from a wildlife photography blind. There are two different types of blinds that you may use in this scenario. The first type of blind is a stationary blind, which is the kind that is back here behind me. A stationary blind stays in one place, which means that any animal that is around it is going to be used to it being there and will not be disturbed or frightened by it being there in the slightest, which makes stationary blinds, in my opinion, the best to photograph out of. The second type of blind is a portable blind. For dealing with smaller animals like birds, I think that a portable blind is without a doubt the best option for you. This is because they're going to feel less frightened by it than a deer or a larger animal may. However, a portable blind can still be used to get great photos of, an, of animals besides birds if used properly without photographing the animals. I like to leave a portable blind up for one to three days before I actually use it to give the animals time to get used to it being there and they're going to be less likely to be frightened by it when I'm inside there trying to photograph them. Straight ahead of me in the brush up here, there is a Carolina wren. Um, for the past few minutes, he's been chirping and he's been really outstretching his mouth and um, making a very loud and distinct call. Um, there's quite a few wrens back here in this area and a bunch of them have been um, calling to one another and making sounds. I'm not really sure why. Um, I don't know if it's to kind of alert them that I'm here or if they're doing something else. But um, I am getting some really good photos of him right now. Um, he's not in great light or she is not in great light. Um, because they are in the shade and um, the lighting right now is really good for photography as we just talked about a few moments ago there's clouds covering the sun and so even though it's not golden hour yet it, the sun isn't directly overhead but even though it's not golden hour the fact that it does have um, clouds over it diffusing the light um, is making for a really nice soft light you can kind of see that on my face right now um, on here on the left side of my face um, I'm gonna take a few more shots of this wren and then I have some more things that I want to talk to you all about. But for the time being, you can probably hear him chirping, actually. Um, I, absolutely beautiful. This is a great experience. I'm pretty close. He doesn't seem to be that frightened. Um, I'm going to go ahead and take a few more photos, and then um, I'm going to talk about some more stuff to you all. When taking part in wildlife photography, the most important thing is to not put yourself or the animal in any sort of danger. Here are some important rules to keep in mind when photographing an animal. First off, maintain a safe distance from the animal even if it isn't a dangerous animal and yes, even if the photos aren't as close as what you would like them to be. You don't want to get yourself hurt or disturb the animal in its natural habitat. Um, second, it's always great to have some background knowledge about the animal that you're photographing. 
If you're going out to photograph a whitetail deer, it's great to read up about their behavior online and learn something about them before just rushing out into the field to photograph them. As taking part in wildlife photography, you not only have the duty to document that animal for years to come, but it's also your duty to keep that animal safe and to not put them in harm's way. That's not something that you should just take lightly. So although I came out here today with the intention of only photographing birds, and that's what I've pretty much did during this entire segment because that was my objective to get out and find some beautiful um, birds to photograph, I had um, some really great encounters with some other animals as well. Um, I saw a little slithery friend, we'll say I had a really um, pretty close up encounter with a snake, but it wasn't a poisonous snake, so I wasn't in any sort of danger. I'm gonna zoom you all in a little bit more here. Um, I also um, had the chance to see a lot of different sort of insects. Um, I got some great photos of a butterfly. I got some great photos of what I think was a dragonfly. It was actually a new species that I'd never photographed before, so that was really exciting, and I got to do that by a creek. So I got some pretty unique photos there using all of the tips that I've talked about earlier. Um, it was very important for me when photographing those animals on the ground to get down and get low and not only squat down, but for some of them I even laid flat on the ground on my stomach to get um, as low to the ground as possible to photograph them in the way that I believed looked the best possible way to do that. Um, so that was that was really exciting to be able to get out here and not just photograph birds which was my main intention don't get me wrong but it's always great to see some other species as well um, there's so many birds just around this forest that i'm in um, and right beside of right now so it's really great to just be out in nature and experience this um, however i do believe i had some pretty great luck today so i am going to go ahead and call it a day here um, i'm going to put all of the photos that i was able to capture during this segment on your screens here in just a few moments. Um, once you get a chance to look at those photos and once those photos are overlaid on your screen, we're going to transition to me in my office where I'm giving you editing tips on how to properly um, edit your wildlife and bird photography images. Um, it can be a little bit tricky. I'm gonna give you a tutorial in Lightroom and Photoshop. I do understand that there's a lot of other all editing alternatives out there, but Lightroom and Photoshop is what I use. And for animal photography, I'm probably going to recommend that you all use Lightroom and Photoshop as well. Um, Luminar AI is a really great photo editor from what I hear, but I do think at the current moment of filming this, it is more aimed at portrait photography. So I stick, um, for my bird and wildlife photography, I stick with Lightroom and Photoshop. So without further ado, go ahead and check out these photos and I will see you all in my office. Hey everyone, we're here in my office now and I'm about to hop on the iMac here behind me. Um, when I am at home and um, I'm in a stationary location at my office, I edit on the iMac. Um, when I'm traveling, I edit on the um, Air Mac, uh, on the MacBook Air, I mean, <laughs> I don't mean Air Mac. You all know what I mean. Anyways, I've got some photos pulled up that I want to show you all how I'm going to edit them today and just give you some kind of tips and stuff, so let's go ahead and hop on the iMac. So we're on the iMac now and the first thing that I do once I get on my computer is to move any of the files that I'm wanting to edit onto my portable hard drive. This is pretty self-explanatory so I'm not going to show that whole process. Um, but now as you notice I'm in Lightroom. Typically I will have all of the photos that I am planning on editing from uh, the time that I've been out and I've taken the raw images. But today um, I just have three in my quick selection. What I usually do is I pick um, the best shots out of all of the ones that I took while I've been out on a photo shoot and I add them to my quick selection and then I edit them from there. But for the sake of this video, I have selected um, three special photos that I want to show you all how I edit um, in Lightroom and Photoshop and I'm going to talk a little bit on that and so I'm here in my quick selection bar now to edit them. So let's go ahead and get started. The first um, photo that I'm going to be selecting to edit is this um, photo of a tufted titmouse here. 
um, it's a pretty good photo it was in the snow it was back this winter and it's it's pretty it's pretty cool I'm happy with how it looks but the first thing that I want to do is adjust the crop so the crop on this is not really great it's centered I don't like that we talked about that earlier um, that you want to put it in the rule of thirds and the great thing about Lightroom is is when you click R to crop it actually shows you the lines um, instead of doing this in horizontal I want it in vertical or orientation so I'm gonna go ahead and do that like that and that looks like a pretty good framing of what I was hoping to do so um, it is a little bit underexposed so I'm gonna go ahead and add some exposure about um, 0.3 stops I'm gonna up this contrast here um, and just for the sake of time I'm not going to do this um, exactly how I would if I was um, fully editing it I'm just gonna kind of do a rough edit here um, I love to add clarity clarity is one of my favorite things so um, you all have probably noticed there is snow back here in the background but it's giving me a little bit of a warm vibe so I'm going to adjust the color temperature um, you don't want to overdo it or it's obvious um, I really want to kind of bring in a bluer tone um, I think that did a pretty decent job um, I'm going to adjust a few more settings here now that I've did that to kind of recompensate what I was looking for um, I'm not going to adjust any of the hues but I am going to up the blue tones in the photo um, I'm also going to up the orange just a smidge to kind of bring this here on the feathers up and to bring the background up because it's um, a brownish orange now what I'm going to do I'm not going to do anything to um, really color color to um, color correct it or color grade anything um, I'm just gonna leave those be how they are I'm gonna go down here to sharpen and I'm pressing option on my keyboard and then I'm dragging this mask and what is white is what um, Lightroom will sharpen what is black it will not affect at all because if you up your sharpening and it affects the whole image sometimes that can introduce a lot of noise and grain into the photo that we don't need so I'm gonna do this to about 95 um, and I'm gonna check my mask again just to make sure that it's not yeah so it's just kind of sharpening this branch here um, that's in focus as well as um, like the eye and some basic parts of the tip mouse um, so now what I'm going to do is I'm gonna go ahead and put this image into Photoshop and I'm gonna do a few more adjustments so to do that I right click the photo and then I'm gonna go over here and click edit in Adobe Photoshop 2021 so um, now the photo was here and loaded into Lightroom so the first thing I'm going to do is to go over here to my layers panel and um, unlock the photo so we can do some um, more extensive edits now I'm not going in depth today but the first thing that I usually like to do is to take out any object that could distract you potentially from the main subject of the image this um, image was a pretty simple composition so I did a pretty good job at eliminating most distractions in the original composition but this twig up here in the right corner is um, I, I don't really like the way that look and that could potentially pull your eye away from the bird so I'm gonna click L to bring up my lasso tool and then what I'm doing as I'm just kind of circling this twig it doesn't have to be spot on you can miss a few spots like that then I'm pressing shift delete on my keyboard to which fill is going to come up um, where it says contents make sure that you click content aware and then you're gonna press OK and then Photoshop is just um, going to go ahead and get rid of that which is great um, it is being a little slow um, usually it would just do that in an instant but um, I've got Lightroom, Final Cut Pro and Google all opened up here along with Photoshop so it is being a little slower than usual even though it's a beast of a computer and iMac is great and I totally recommend it don't get me wrong um, now typically what I would do at this point is I would add a fill layer and dodge and burn but for the sake of time in this video I'm not going to do that if you do want to see a full um, editing tutorial that's just focused on editing in Lightroom and Photoshop you can click in the top right corner of your video right here um, I have a video detailing how I edit my wildlife photography photos um, so now what I'm doing is I'm pressing W on my keyboard and I'm going to outline um, this isn't going to be perfect just um, now if I was really taking my time in editing this image I would make sure that every little part of this um, bird was selected but um, like I said for the sake of time today I'm just not gonna do that so that's pretty good so now what I'm gonna do is press command C and then command V 
which um, you will notice over here in the layers tab, it has now added the tip mouse um, as a layer separate on its own. Just kind of a rough selection there, as you can see if I do away with layer zero. So you're gonna make sure that you've got layer one selected. You're gonna go up here to where it says filter. You're gonna go down to other and you're gonna click high pass. Now you don't wanna go too high with this number. I usually do it anywhere between around 0 0.9 to 2.1 you don't want to go too far if you go too far it's obvious that you've kind of rendered it and um, basically what this does is just bring out the details and sharpen it for this particular image where I already sharpened it quite a bit in Photoshop I'm gonna do it more on the low end I'm thinking probably actually 0 0.9 which is usually as low as I go sometimes I go lower but 0 0.9 should be okay so I pressed OK, and now you can see there's just kind of this ugly gray blotch there over the area that I selected, um, and that looks really bad. So we want to get away um, and do away with that. So under the Layers tab here, you see that um, your um, Overlay option is under Normal. So now what you want to do is, um, I guess in theory, you could pick one of these color ones, but it's all going to look really bad. So what you want to do is go down here to Overlay and select that. And um, it has definitely sharpened the image more. Well, not the image, but the BERT. Um, here, I will kind of show you. See, when I do away with that layer one, you can see that it's just kind of adding a little bit more detail into the photo, which um, looks really good, and I'm a huge fan of that. So now I'm going to do one more thing here in Photoshop. Um, typically, I would do a little bit more, um, but once again, just for time's sake, I'm not going to do all of that. I'm going to do a basic outline here of the bird um, using the lasso tool. So to do that, you press L on your keyboard, just like we did a second ago. So once you've outlined that, you want to do Command-Shift-I. And what that does is that inverted your selection. So you can see now that um, everything except this general area in here where I'm moving my mouse around right now is selected. So what you want to do in this case is go up here into... Actually, I want to go ahead and merge these two layers together before I do this. So to do that, you can do Command-Shift-E, and that may, um, that merges your layer, so it's all into one layer now. Um, now that you've done that, you can go up here into Filter. You can go into Blur, and click Gaussian Blur. Now, very similar um, to High Pass, you do not want to go too far with this, um, or it's going to be obvious that it's been edited. I had it really high because when I do my YouTube thumbnails, I like to do it really high. But that's an example of it being high. If you did it that high, it's really obvious that um, that's not bokeh from your camera. So I usually like to do it anywhere from 0 0.6 to around 2. Um, I usually don't go all the way up to 2, though, because that can begin to look unrealistic. So for this photo, I think I'm going to do um, probably 0.9. Um, I'm going to press OK. And there's not really a huge difference, but that's good because we want it to be subtle for this image. We don't want people to look at this and say, oh, he added blur to that. Um, so this is going to be all that I'm going to do in Photoshop. I'm going to click Command S now, um, which is saving it. And then um, I'm going to exit out of Photoshop and go back into Lightroom and do some more basic edits. And then I export it. So we're back in Lightroom now. And... Um, this photo is the one that we edited in Photoshop, so it has all of our Photoshop adjustments on it, which is great. Um, but there are a few more basic adjustments that I want to do now that it's finished. Um, I'm going to up my whites just a little bit more. I like um, a, a main, like if I had to pick a style for my images, um, as far as editing goes, my style is definitely um, kind of bright and vibrant. That's that's my style, honestly. I don't like underexposed images. Um, I want to make sure that my whites are usually pretty far up, and then I like to have a lot of vibrance on it. Um, if you go through my Instagram and scroll through my feed, you'll notice that that's a pretty big pattern in all of my photos. Um, so this is looking pretty good. Like I said, we don't really do that much more in Lightroom after Photoshop. Just a few more basic adjustments. Honestly, I think this here is probably the final photo. Yeah, I think we're pretty good. So at this point, what I'm going to do is export it. So to do that, I do Command-Shift-E. Um, and that's going to pull this up. And then under custom text, I will say um, tufted tit, tit mouse in the snow. And then I will click export and it will save it to whatever fo uh, folder that you have chosen, which is um, on my desktop and then edited pictures. Um, I'm not going to save this because I've already got an edit of it, obviously. 
but that's how you do that. So I'm gonna go on to this image. I actually think this is gonna be the last one we do, um, because like I said, I, um, if you all want to see how I fully edit photos, you can go and click my edit my editing tutorial, which will which was in the top right corner of your screen a few minutes ago. Um, so this is gonna be the last photo I edit um, today. Not really gonna do anything different with, with this one that we did on the last one, but I'm just gonna show it to you all again for a little bit of a refresher. Um, I added a lot of contrast, as you all might have noticed. Now, this photo was a little too overexposed for me, so I'm gonna bring it down about um, 0.35 stops. Um, I'm gonna up my shadows quite a bit here to make sure that the butterfly is still good and exposed. Um, like I said, I like to have a lot of whites in my photo. That there looks pretty good. Um, I'm gonna bring down my highlights a bit because I don't want my highlights to ruin um, the photo because there could be too many on these yellow flowers. I'm actually pretty okay with this crop, but I am gonna bring it in just a little bit. Um, about there I think looks good. Actually, no. There, maybe. You know what? I'm just gonna leave the original crop because I think I like the original crop better than anything. Um, so I'm going to up the clarity because I love upping the clarity as well. I'm going to up the vibrance. I'm going to do the saturation just a smidge. And this one, I am going to mess with the hues though. Um, for greens in a, in a situation like this, I like to bring them more to the blue side. Um, it just kind of makes them pop a little bit more, I think, when you're with yellow. I don't want to overdo it or it's obvious. Um, I think plus seven on the green um, hue slider looks pretty good. Um, I'm just I'm not gonna mess with any other other colors because the green is the only thing that I'm really wanting to change here. Um, I'm gonna up the yellow saturation as well, so um, it does make it a little less obvious that I've altered the greens in this photo. Um, I'm also going to up the orange saturation as well to make the butterfly pop a little bit more. Um, it's important to not overdo this, so since I've did that, I am gonna down do my um, vibrance a little bit. Um, those flowers are really bright, almost too bright, so um, under the luminance panel, uh, I'm going to bring down the yellows just a little bit, probably 0 0.12. Um, and this image has a really yellow tone to it in general, so you probably notice that that almost um, darkened the entire image. So to recompensate for that, I am going to bring up my shadows a little bit. Um, and I do think I want to crop this down a little bit. I don't really know how. I'm just going to kind of mess with this here. Bring it a little this way, maybe. Yeah, I think that looks better. Um, I'm going to make these greens pop just a little bit more. Plus 10 looks better, I think. Orange just a tad more. Um, you really just got to kind of mess with it. You don't want to overdo it. For this image, I'm not going to color grade either. Um, very rarely for wildlife photos do I find myself color grading. And, I mean, I it's there's really just not a need to color grade most of the time for wildlife, but sometimes there are certain scenarios where it's good to do that. So, as you can see here, I'm masking out um, what I want to sharpen, and I'm bringing that up to about 80. Um, that looks pretty good. Um, honestly, this photo doesn't even really need to be brought into Photoshop. I think when I did the original edit for this um, shot, I didn't put it in Photoshop. There's not really any distractions, but um, I'm I'm gonna bring it into Photoshop, and that's to um, add a blur around it to just bring the focus in a little bit more on the butterfly. Because um, for a macro shot um, where the wing tips are um, not entirely in focus, you don't want to use high pass, or it's gonna um, make that look really grainy and kind of bad. Because as you can see, the focus is just here on the head, and so you want to. Um, only put high pass on areas that are completely in focus and so if I put high pass on this butterfly that would um, mess it up a little bit so I am gonna go ahead and open it in Photoshop and then I'm gonna add that Gaussian blur okay so we're here in Photoshop now I unlock the image so we are able to edit it more um, all I need to do is click L to get my lasso tool it's already pulled up here I'm just gonna do a basic outline of this butterfly here like so If that was a drawing on paper, you would not know that was a butterfly based on the shape I just did that. So um, that does kind of prove it doesn't have to be exact, obviously. And so now you do Command-Shift-I to invert that. 
and I'm gonna go up here and the filter, um, go down to blur, Gaussian blur, um, and I'm gonna do a little bit more than usual on this one. I'm gonna do about 1.3 just to really make that pop because there's already a lot of bokeh in this photo, so you're not really gonna notice um, adding a decent amount of more. So I'm gonna click OK, Command D to get rid of that selection, and yeah, that's really uh, all there is to this. I think that looks oh. My bad, my bad. That looks pretty. That looks pretty good. Cause you can see the butterflies um, really sharpen and focus, and then back here around it, um, it's got a nice blur to it. So, yeah, I'm I'm really happy with how this has turned out. I'm gonna go ahead and click Command S to save this, and then I'm gonna go back into Lightroom once more and see if there's any final edits that I want to do on the shot. Okay, so I'm back here in Lightroom. Honestly, there, I'm not really seeing anything that I want to do. Um, I, th I think I'm going to warm it up just a little bit. I don't want to go too far. It'll mess with those greens that I changed earlier. going to up the whites just a little bit more. I don't want to overdo that. Um, down the highlights. A little more contrast. A um, little more on the black side. Yeah. I mean, this seems to be about it. This shot is one of my all-time favorites. I am going to add a little bit more gr gr to the blue side here. Yes. Mm, that's a little too much. Okay, yeah. That right there looks good. It, if your eye isn't messed up like mine, you probably didn't even notice that changed anything. But um, I've spent so many hours looking at a computer, editing photos. I'm pretty good at catching just the slightest color correction. Um... This orange here just needs to pop a little bit more. I don't want the flowers to sidetrack it, so I am going to bring this orange up quite a bit, actually. And then I'm going to bring the red up, too, because it's got some red tones in it. Yeah, I think I think that there looks pretty good. That looks pretty good. So to export this, you would do Command-Shift-E, and then you would save it. Um, but, of course, I've already got an edit of this photo. This was just for the sake of this video. Um, so that's all as far as editing goes. Remember, if you are curious on how I fully go into depth on editing wildlife photography photos, you can click um, in the top right corner of the screen on the info card and check out that video. So um, I'm going to go ahead and hop off of the computer now. So you all literally just got an entire bird and wildlife photography tutorial. So what are you waiting for? Go outside and start shooting. This video was a whole lot of work for me to write, um, edit, produce. Um, there was a whole lot of work that went into this, so if you could go down below and smash that like button and hit that red subscribe button, it would help me out so much. It really does, if you know it or not. Um, if there's any part of this video that you didn't fully grasp the concept of or didn't fully understand, I have timestamps to each section in the video that you can go down below in the description and look at. Or you can use the red scrubber bar and it will um, show you what section is where. Um, so that's really handy for you all to look at. Thank you all so much for watching this tutorial. Feel free to share it with your friends. Leave a comment down below. If you have any questions, comment it down below as well. And I will try to answer it to the best of my ability. Once again, thank you all so much for watching this tutorial. And I hope you all have an amazing day.